All right, so joining us today is Dr. Scott Tony Dandel, and he is at UNC Charlotte, and he does a lot of research on like leadership, diversity, inclusion, statistics, measurement, assessment, like all of that good stuff. Um, did I get it right? Yeah, just about everything. Fuck yeah. See, you can tell that I went on the web page earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, yeah, where's he again? What's he do? Um, so the reason why we have the soapbox, do you want to pause it or how do we do it? Go ahead. <laughs> The reason why we have the IO Soapbox is to try to showcase some of the really cool things that IOs are doing and get people interested in the field and kind of just see how cool it can be. So I guess the best way to start is just tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now that you are the most passionate about. Yeah, so I think the things that I'm most passionate about right now are um, a variety of projects around you know, what I call big data, data analytics, people analytics, whatever term you want to use. Um, but basically trying to leverage some of these tools and techniques from computer science to tackle questions that we're interested in in psychology. Um, so some of the projects, I'm actually be talking about one of them tomorrow, uh, which is a project around understanding challenges that leaders face. Okay. And so in this study, I've actually got data from over 8,000 leaders that went through a leadership development program. Okay. But as part of this, they talk about the, their most significant challenges as a leader or manager. So I've got, you know, 8,000 free text responses. And the question is, well, what do you do with that? Obviously. Cry. Yeah, right. So do traditionally we what we do is drink? we manually code that, okay. right? Yes. And in fact, we actually um, had some data like this a number of years ago. And I had an undergrad work on it for her thesis and spent the year and coded like 300 of these, right? And that's about how far we got in that year's worth Dear of time. Dear God, you said 8,000, right? 8, 000, right? And we, well, so the data set I'm going to talk about tomorrow is 8,000, but I actually have another data set that's got over 40,000. That is the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. Yeah, so it's all unstructured free text. And so mm. what we want to do is we want to understand things like, oh, what are the most significant ch challenges that leaders have? Yeah. You know, how do those challenges relate to one another? How do the challenges relate to what we know about the leader? So, for example, do men and women experience different kinds of challenges? Do oh. first-time managers versus, um, you know, upper-level executives experience yeah. different kinds of challenges and so on? Um, and so I'm going to talk about our process tomorrow built on natural language processing called structural topic models. And so what it does is it basically takes all of that text and figures out with, um, with all of these words, like, well, what are these words talking about? And basically creates these topics out of these words. And those topics are the challenges that people face. And then you can begin to explore, well, what are antecedents of those challenges? What do those challenges yes. relate to and so on? Um, and so that's one project that I'm working on. A lot of my other work also involves handling text and scoring text. Um, Why do you like text so much? Well, so we have lots of text, right? So there's a lot of text available and we haven't really had anything useful to do with it up to this point. Do you mean like in general, you're talking about like everybody. Yeah, well, has, we, we know we've we have got tons of text, right? I mean, right. So, so think about it. yesterday, 250 billion emails were sent. That sounds exhausting. Right? I'm tired. And so how do you, like, like that's very rich data, right? So we've yes. got survey data. Yes. But text data is so much richer and can tell us so and much more authentic. about not... what's happening. You know, potentially harder to fake. You know, yes. you don't think about it. You don't adjust. You know, you're just Speaking providing it. Yeah. Um, and so we have a lot of text. And so I'm really interested in, given that we have all this data, how can we leverage it? Damn. Right? And yeah. so um, some of my work has to do with scoring that text. Right? Okay. So you can uh, basically train algorithms to score that text equivalent to humans. And once you can do that, then you can leverage this massive amount of text that we have. So another project that I'm working on um, with uh, some other folks at UNC Charlotte is around ethical leadership. Okay. Right? So we basically come up with um, this measurement of what we call signals of ethical leadership. And we've had a bunch of um, people on our research team go through CEO letters to shareholders where they um, score every sentence of these letters. But now that we have those scores, that's what we'd call labeled data. 
And with that labeled data, we can then train an algorithm to score that tag. So that's what we're working on now is we're working on building the algorithm to score it. So what that means is that means now we can take new data and feed it in and score it for signals of ethical leadership. And then we can begin to look at, oh, again, what are the antecedents of ethical leadership? What are the consequences of that? And I think one of the things that's unique about what we're doing is we're tying that into our traditional approaches. So we've got not only that, but we've got experimental design, yes. right? So we've got a series of experiments where we're actually manipulating those signals to see how that plays out. So, because mm -hmm. in these field studies, you can't really show causality, but when you tie it in with some experimental design studies, then you can. Right. So. so there's a lot on leadership here, mm -hmm. and there's a lot that goes into analytics. When did you get in, in into analytics and why? Like, what brought you there? Yeah, so it was probably a confluence of a bunch of random events that came together. So one of them was, um, you know, if people are just so saying... So by chance, if you will. Yeah, definitely by chance. Bit, yeah, a little, a little statistical humor. humor good, yeah. good for you. Um, so if you were to ask people, oh, methodologically, what am I known for? Most people would say it's relative importance analysis, yes. right? And so if you think about the issue of relative importance analysis, it relates a lot to big data when you have lots of predictors, right? Yes. And so there's sort of an intersection with that and uh, some sort of analysis where you have lots of predictors, right? Um, so that's one area. Another um, reason that it sort of happened was I got interested in R. Um, and interestingly enough, wow. I got interested in R pedagogically. Um, <laughs> Something that only a professor would say. Yeah, well, because, right. <laughs> you know, I was teaching the undergraduate statistics class and we were teaching SPSS and I frankly was getting frustrated with yes. it. I was getting frustrated with it because it's not cutting edge, it's behind the times. Yes. I was sort of faced with this situation where if I wanted to teach about a particular topic, I, had, I could either teach them the wrong way because that was the only way that SPS did it or yeah. not teach at all, right? Yeah. And then I was also frustrated because, you know, I'd spend all this time teaching them how to use SPSS and then students would graduate. And if they didn't go to a school that had SPSS, it was all wasted. And right. so I started teaching R a number of years ago, and um, obviously there's a big intersection between R and data science, and so that got mm -hmm. me sort of heading down that path as well. And uh, the third event that was happening at the same time is I was working on one of these data simulation studies, um, and we were generating all these conditions, and it just turned out that like we ended up having you know, over a billion lines of data from the simulation because we had, you know, 10,000 iterations, but we oh, had, no. you know, six or seven independent variables that all had multiple levels to it. And yes, so when you start yes. thinking about like oh. simulating all the cases oh. for all those replications <laughs> for all of the factorial design, we're in like the billions of cases kind of thing. And I'm like, how do I analyze this how data, right? It? And so I started investigating these ways of like, oh, using Amazon Web Services to yes. do the yes. analysis, you know, in the cloud and that kind of stuff. And, and this was all probably about, I mean, the R stuff was probably about eight or so years ago and it was all about the same time. Um, and so, so I started thinking about these issues and then I did the book on big data, right? And so, but that's sort of how that came about was those sort of initial interests. So it wasn't in graduate school that you got excited about that? No. That's no. fascinating. Yeah. Um, so I'm loving this conversation mm -hmm. because secretly I'm a statistician, um, but a lot of, you know, I, I, I teach statistics mm -hmm. and I teach statistics at a graduate level. And I've taught at a bunch of other levels previously and to other groups of people. And of course, you teach statistics, I can tell. Um, so you have probably encountered the fear a lot mm -hmm. and the, I can't do this. And so I know that even though I'm loving this conversation, there are probably people out there who are listening to this and going, oh my God, that's overwhelming and scary. Um, what do you have to say to people who might be interested in IO psychology, mm -hmm. but are scared about that data analytics yeah. component of it? Mm -hmm. Well, so I, th I think it's interesting because if you were to look at just a typical, you know, first semester statistics class and I were to say, OK, well, what math do you need to know to do that class? Yeah. Right. Well, you need to be able to add, mm -hmm. subtract, mm -hmm. multiply, divide, square a number and take the square root. Facts. That's it. There, there is okay. no math more complicated than that. That's right. Right. And so. You know, I think, well, gosh, you know, my 
kids in elementary school can do those things. Sure. And so you as an undergrad should be able to do those things, right? And so um, I think if you sell it to them like that, it's like, it's really no harder than algebra, right? Yes. It's really basic algebra. It looks scary because you have these big formulas and things yes. like that, but it's all about how it looks, right? It's all about creating this image like, hey, I love it, right? I publish in stats and methods and I love it because, you know, I can pretend like I know more than other people because they don't understand what I'm doing and then I seem all important and great and stuff like that. He does, he does. Um, <laughs> but if you break it down, it's, it's really on the math side, it's that simple. It's more of a, actually a conceptual problem when you're mm -hmm. thinking about those issues. And when you say, oh, well, it's really just like a thought exercise. It's not a math exercise. It's really a thought exercise. It's really thinking about, you know, what is this, you know, I, I can plug numbers into this equation and get a result, but it's really about thinking about like, well, what would happen if I did that 10,000 times, right? Because that's yes. really what all statistics is about. Like this yes. imaginary hypothetical experiment where you do it over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the first things I start off with when, I, when I'm in stats classes. I'm like, look, I know you guys, you know, aren't math majors. Like, a, you know, you self-selected into psychology. <laughs> um, and there are lots of reasons why people do that. Um, and one of them is that they're often afraid of math. But when you're like, you have nothing to be afraid of in this class. Like, it's really just that. So, okay. One strategy. How about that leadership side? How'd you get into the leadership? Um, so the leadership, again, I mean, I, I think of all of my accomplishments as being luck and, and just being at the right place at the right time. Uh, I, I mean, honestly, I think that that's very true. Um, yes. And it just so happens that where I live, not too far away, is the Center for Creative Leadership. And they That's have a bunch of true. fantastic I'm bad with geography, so I didn't even think yeah, about Yeah, so it. <laughs> um, even though I work in Charlotte, I actually live in Winston-Salem. Mm. Um, and right next to Winston-Salem, the big city is Greensboro, so it's about 50 minutes away. And the yeah. Center for Creative Leadership, their international headquarters is there. You know, they're based in, you know, over 100 countries and um, have a number of IO psychologists. Actually, our North Carolina IO psychology meeting meets there once a year. Um, and so I just built up some relationships with them. They were really interested in trying to expand their analytics capabilities. And they said, well, who do we know who does that? I was going to well, say, that's person. why you do statistics, though, because it makes you attractive to a lot of different people who don't know how to do the analytics. Right. And, not, and again, not just big data kind of stuff, but just yes. statistics in general. Yes. Right. So I can think about the number of projects that I've been on where someone comes to me and is like, I've got this really cool data set, but I don't know how to analyze it. Would you be willing to help us out? Yeah. And all of a sudden I've got access to some really cool That's data right. Right. and it gets me a publication. So. What skill, so for folks entering graduate school mm -hmm. in IO psychology, either at the master's or the PhD level, what skills are the most useful for them? What do you recommend they do? and focus on? Uh, I know so, it's a broad question. So in preparation or during graduate school? Let's you know, do both. Let's do both. <laughs> um, yeah, well, so, I mean, I definitely think methodological skills are critical. And I think the more you can get exposed to that stuff, the better. Um, so when I was in graduate school, I went to Rice. And at the time, Rice was actually a tiny program. Um, we actually only had two faculty members there when I started. Um, there was one, two full-time faculty members and one visitor. So we had sort of the typical like ANOVA kind of class for semester or regression kind of class, second semester. And then the only other required methods class was a multivariate class that we didn't even offer. Yeah. Um, and it was tough. So you had to basically to graduate, you had to go take a class at University of Houston. Um, and so we, all, right. so we all did that. But that was like the extent of our methods training. And I think it was sort of my second year of graduate school, um, Karma had just started. And they had their first ever mini conference in Richmond, Virginia. And, you know, one of the faculty members at Rice is like, do you want to go to this thing? I was like, well, sure, if you're going to pay, I'll go. Um, and so we went and it was this transformative experience for me because I was there, you know, I think there were 10 faculty members and like 20 students, right? And the faculty members are Larry Williams and Larry James and Jeff Edwards and Bob Vandenberg yes, and, sure. you know, all these, you know, stars in our field in the methods area. And they basically just gave like hour and a half lectures for mm -hmm. like two straight days. And I hadn't heard of any of this stuff. Like, I hadn't heard of different scores. I hadn't heard of measurement equivalents. I hadn't heard of 
any of this stuff. And I went back and I was like, oh my gosh, like, first of all, it's interesting. And secondly, like, I got to figure out how to expose myself to that kind of stuff. Um, and I basically, from then on, I would go over to University of Houston. I took a class every semester there because um, they did have a quantitative psychology program. And I just took, you know, I took item response theory. I took structural equation modeling. I took longitudinal modeling. I took another modeling class. Um, and you so looked was, for the word modeling. You accidentally yeah, ended like, up on the I was runway like, well, let me at some go, point in time. Let me go show know? up there and yeah. take it. Um, and see what happens. Um, and I actually organized sort of my own little like research methods meeting. Yeah. Um, and so it, was, it would actually be me, one other student and a faculty member would meet every other week. And, and I put together my own syllabus and stuff to try and learn this oh. stuff because we didn't have that kind of class. Yeah. Um, but I think what it did was it gave me a huge competitive advantage, right? Yes. It gives me an advantage because I can do some cutting edge analyses. People <laughs> seek me out yes. to help them with analyses. Yes. It gives me a whole other area to research um, because now I don't, I'm not just in my content area, but then I also have a methods area as well. Um, so I can often publish more than one publication, you know, in, uh, on a single topic. Makes sense. Um, and, and so I think that's a critical skill. I also think that writing is an important skill. So again, a lot of times, um, I mean, I think I was, I was fortunate that I went to a small liberal arts school where you would do a lot of writing and I was terrible at it. I was terrible at it when I went to graduate school. Um, fortunately for me, my wife is an amazing writer. That's awesome. And she had to suffer reading many, many drafts of my master's thesis and incessantly mock me for how terrible of a writer I was. That's a good way. But it, it, over time, I built up that skill. And, and I think that's something that's often neglected. They don't realize how important that is because how you craft that story is critical. I mean, again, the commodity that we have is our publications um, and how you craft that story makes such a difference. You could have, you know, great data and great, you know, great findings and so on. But if you don't put it together right where the reviewers see that, then you're out, you know, it doesn't do you any good. So this is the publishing side of our profession and um, folks who are in research oriented appointments like Scott have got to publish. That's part of how they get evaluated, how they get, you know, tenure decisions made. Some of us who are on like the more administrative and teaching track don't have quite the same incentives. But on that side, you're right. You have to be able to sell the story um, as well as the actual findings. What are you most excited about in IO psychology in general? Like what what do you love the most about IO? Oh, well, I mean, the thing I love the most about IO is just the people. Um, so as you know, I'm pretty heavily involved in PSYOP service. You are. You're kind of like everywhere. And it's, a, it's a little bit <laughs> yeah. creepy, but and, that's okay. Well, and people ask me, they're like, why, you know, why do you do this? You know, why do you, why do you volunteer for all these positions and so on? And, and mostly it's because it's of the people that I've met and the friendships that I've made in those, in those roles, yeah. really. So, I agree. I completely agree. Um, all right, to close out, because I want to be respectful of your time, it is a Friday evening. It is a Friday <laughs> evening. Um, <laughs> uh, are there any, you know, one of the things that I found interesting as you're talking to me, and I, and I actually really identify with this a lot because I feel the same way about my career, is you kept talking about how lucky you were and the role that luck played. But I also heard from you a lot of really proactive things that you were doing to set yourself up to bring together opportunities for yourself. Um, so you kind of have both sides of that, which again, I identify and agree with. Well, let me, let me just tell two stories. That's exactly what I want. So I want I'll, stories I'll at the end. With, I'll end with go. two stories. So, <laughs> um, again, if I think about like transformative things that happen in my career, um, you know, one of them was incredibly lucky. So I've had this track record of publishing with James LeBreton, who's a really great friend of mine. And, uh, Damn. And I think about like the <laughs> very first time I met him, we were presenting a paper that we had done together. I had never met him in person. We we're doing a paper together that we presented in PSYOP that then was a JAP. And the very next thing we did was a psych methods. And the very next thing was an ORM. And so we just had this like incredible track record of success at these high impact journals. And again, the only reason I knew him was completely random where I was at PSYOP one year and I ran into a person that I knew and he's, we were talking about stuff and he goes, you know who you would just hit it off with? James LeBreton, like, yeah, I just know you guys would be like best friends and get along great and work together. But you we're guys, best friends. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, but you guys would like, 
you know, just be fantastic. I'm going to, I'm going to introduce you guys. And he actually never did introduce us. <laughs> um, but after PSYOP, like I got an email and he's like, you know, Hey, Scott, here's James, James, here's Scott. You guys need to do like science together or something. Do right. Together. Um, but so this person who did that, his name's Mark Buller. Mm. And the reason I met him was because he married the daughter of the social psychologist in my department. Oh my God. And otherwise I would have never had any reason oh to talk to Mark at Psyop. I talked to Mark at Psyop because I was at his wedding. Oh my God. You know, when he yes. married yes. the daughter of the social psychologist at Davidson, you know. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. and, and so I think that was a big transformative aspect. Um, mm. And then another story that I'm going to leave you with, and I'm actually going to steal someone else's story. I like um, that. I appreciate yeah. that. So this is a, a so story. Just of, cite it appropriately, well, this, and then it's not yeah, stealing. So this is a story about Mickey Hebel. Um, so Mickey Hebel is um, a Everything. champion of mine. Uh, I just value you know, what she's meant to my career so much. But she has this thing that she calls her anti-Vita. Okay? And so if you look at Mickey Hebel, she's unbelievably successful, has this amazing publication track record, wins all of these national awards, a fellow and all this stuff, right? But she, she'll she go and give these talks where she'll put up not her Vita, but her anti-Vita. So what her anti-Vita is, is it's not, you know, where she went to school, it's all the schools that she applied to that she didn't get in. Okay? All the it's papers she put in all the, the It's not where she works, you know, she works at Rice, but when she got the rice job, she applied to something like 80 jobs and got two interviews, right? And, you know, you've, she's got all of her list of publications and it's not where they got published, but where they got rejected. And it's amazing when you look at that list and you're like, oh my gosh, this person who I thought was Talk like Midas touch, you know, everything yes. she does turns to gold is actually full of failure. And it's just resilient. Oh, God, and it's, it's, you know, yes. just doesn't know enough to quit <laughs> and just keeps going. <laughs> right. And, and so that's part of it. You know, so you talk about being proactive. It's really just like, just keep persistent. pushing along, being persistent, you know, not giving up, realizing that a lot of the process is random. And so the more opportunities you have, the more likely you are to get one of those things to, to work out. And then it just begins to snowball. That was fucking awesome. There you go. Thank you it so much. It was only awesome because it was Mickey's story. Because I mean, everything like, about whole, Mickey's awesome. It was so. the, whole, the whole thing. It wasn't just that moment. Come on, zoom out. The whole thing was awesome. Thank you so much, sure. Scott, for joining yeah. us. Um, and hopefully converting some more people to statistics and analytics. Yeah. And hard work and persistence. Because that is a huge amount of it. So, all good.